Here you see on the screen our scripture reading. Hebrews chapter 2. We read 3, but we're going to introduce 3 with verse 2. Very important contrast that is made here and a very somber and solemn question that we need to contemplate on. And it is my prayer that the Holy Spirit will illuminate our minds and bring convictions to our hearts as we ponder on this important passage of Scripture. We're told here, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2, it says, For if the word spoken by angels, we'll put a pause right there. I understand it says angels, but if you look at the original Greek New Testament word, the word means messengers. Now, yes, angels could be messengers. Angels have come and delivered a message to Mary. You know, you're going to have a son. Angels came and they visited Daniel and they gave him a message. But guess what? Messengers also were the prophets and the men and women of God who he will use to deliver the final invitation of mercy to the world. As we read in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12, and I saw another angel descending from heaven, having the everlasting gospel. That word angel is the same word here. It's a messenger. God is sending messengers to deliver his message. And in this particular reference, we know it's the prophets. Because if you read, and we're not going to turn there, but if you read Hebrews 1.1, the introduction to the book of Hebrews, it starts out by saying that God in ancient times spoke to us through the prophets. So it's very clear what he's referring to. But in these last days, you keep reading Hebrews 1, 1, he has spoken to us through his son. So this is referencing the prophets that delivered God's message. OK, so what about these messengers? It says, for if the word spoken by the angels, the messengers was steadfast. In other words, if what they predicted came to pass and every transgression and disobedience received a just and recompense of reward. Let's stop right there. When Noah said a flood is coming, did it come? Yes, absolutely. And it didn't matter whether the world believed it or not. It didn't matter if Noah was just a minority. Let me tell you, on the day of the flood, he became the majority. And his word came to pass. How about Moses? When Moses said to Pharaoh, let my people go, says the Lord. And Pharaoh said, no. He says, let the people go. No, I'm not going to let them go. Listen, we could do this the easy way. God wants to do it the easy way. Just let them go. No, I'm not going to let them go. Well, then if you don't let them go, listen, God says he's going to send plagues. Did the plagues come? Yeah. Absolutely. And you can go through Isaiah, you can look at Jeremiah, you can look at Ezekiel. They all said, listen, change your ways and you can have this land forever and ever. But if you continue down this direction, you're going to lose everything. Did they lose everything during the Babylonian captivity? Did they forfeit the land and go back into the same miserable condition they were in Egypt as slaves? Did that happen, my brothers and sisters? Absolutely. You can, all the messengers... They gave warnings, and as we read here, the message was steadfast. They came to pass, whether men or women chose to believe it or not. Then you can also look at uh, King Ahab, you know. King Ahab asked the prophet of God, the messenger of God, should I go to war? And he says, you go to war, you're going to die. And he says, well, I'll just disguise myself. I'll put on a disguise, and no one's going to know who I am. And King Ahab, he went to battle. And when the enemies surrounded him and saw him, they said, well, that doesn't look like the king. And they left him alone. And he said, you see, I got away. I don't have to heed the messenger. I was able to work things out by myself. You know what the very next verse says? It says, and then an arrow was shot up, you know, not going in any particular place. Somebody just, you know, there's a poem that says, I shot an arrow in the air, and where it fell, I know not where. 
It was one of those kind of situations. Someone just shot an arrow up in the air and it came and got right between the, the armor plates and he died that day, my brothers. Yes, he did hide from everybody else. But let me tell you, you cannot hide from the God of heaven. And let me tell you, if the words that were spoken by the prophets, if it was true, if it was steadfast, if it came to pass and every what transgression and disobedience received a reward. There's a context. There's a contrast. Well, what about what about the Old Testament prophecies? The question is this. How shall we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us as of the apostles, the, the present day messengers, it was confirmed to us who heard him. Oh, my brothers and sisters, listen, no one is getting away with anything. No one will escape if you neglect not just salvation. So great. You know, it uses that. I love those adverbs that the Bible uses. And I, I don't think I don't think the the people, the messengers writing on the message, I don't think they understood all the adverbs, but they just wrote what God told them to write. God didn't just love the earth world, for God so loved the world. Salvation that God has given us is not just great, it is so great. And how can we escape if we neglect this? The, the most wonderful, the most loving, the most compassionate love. It is a love for a world that did not love him. That is amazing. It is amazing when you think about it. Because he didn't love us. Think about this. He did not love us because we were a good, holy, sanctified people who were being redeemed and restored into him. He didn't love us when we were in that condition. Well, he still does. But that's not when he first manifested his love towards us. The Bible says, Romans 5 verse 8, God commended his love towards us while we were yet sinners. Well, that doesn't sound too bad, Andy. Well, let me read verse 10. For if when we were enemies, when did God love us? When we were his enemy. For when we were his enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. My brothers, think about this. If he showed his compassion, his tender, his mercy, his love towards us when we were still enemies, when we were still sinners. Think about this. How much more will God love us when we become his friends? How much more, my brothers and sisters? How much more? And, you know, it's easy. It's very easy to love people who love you. Isn't that easy? It's easy to love those who show compassion to you. It's easy to, to show kindness to those who are kind to you. That's not what God did for us. He showed us all those things when we hated him, when we were his enemies. And you know, God's, it was our misery. It was our pain. It was our shame. Our sins, our disgrace. Can I say disgrace? Okay, is that, am, I, am I the only one? Do we have any witnesses here who knows what pain, misery, disgrace, and shame is all, is all about? It was when God saw our helplessness, that's what motivated him to come and give his life for us. Our lost condition was the purpose, the reason, and the motive. And you know, he didn't just come reluctantly. He pressed his way to Jerusalem, knowing the cost. He pressed his way to make that sacrifice for each one of us. And even though Satan was telling him in his ear, listen, the only time that the devil said the truth. You say, Andy, how could the devil say the truth? Well, it was, this is the only time. 
All this time, the devil was saying, they're not worth it. Why are you going to give your life for them? It's the only time he spoke the truth. But you know, even though we are not worthy, he saw something in us that we don't see. He saw that by his grace, by his death and sacrifice, he could make us worthy. He can restore us into something beautiful. The vessel of dishonor becomes a vessel of honor through his redeeming sacrifice. How many of you can say no to such a wonderful, compassionate, merciful love of God? My brothers, I'm, I'm, let me tell you, if this is not enough to change your heart, there's absolutely nothing I can say to you. There's nothing that I can do that's going to help to bring about the miracle working power of God to change and to redeem and to restore. If, the, if this doesn't do it, brother, I don't know what more God can do to awaken within us a desire to reach out and to serve and to reciprocate and to return that great love that he's given to us. Yeah. It's a transformative... Listen, you can't have what he wants to give you and stay the same person that you are today. It's impossible. It's a love that transcends everything that we are. And the question that is proposed to us in inspiration is, if we neglect this gift, how shall we escape? If God, the gift of God is not sufficient for you, how are we going to escape? How are we going to escape? We, I know we looked at the, we, we mentioned in passing some examples, but let me read it to you. Let me read to you what the Word of God says. You know, I showed this slide earlier this morning and someone says, oh, look, they're swimming. No, they're not swimming. <laughs> Genesis chapter 7, verse 23 says, and every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the earth. Listen, the question is, how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? But before it asked that question, it says, if the words that were spoken by the messengers, if those words came to pass and they were steadfast. And it says that every living substance, they were destroyed from the earth, we were told. And Paul contrasts that to our day. But notice, by God's grace, some will escape. Some will escape. Notice what it says. And Noah only remained alive. And they that were with him in the ark. My brothers, yes. By God's grace, some will escape. But unfortunately, the vast majority, the question is, how will they escape? No, they did not escape. The reward, the just recompense for sin and for transgression. My brothers, is this, is this too strong of a message? You know, should, should, I, should we try to water it down maybe just a little bit? No, brothers, we cannot do that. Impossible. But the good news is, and the hope that we can obtain is that for some, God provides a way of escape. For some, for those who love him, not just love him, we're told in Revelation, for those who love him and keep his commandments. Was there a command given in this day? Was there a command that says, get in the ark? Was that the command? Was that the message? Was that a loving, compassionate? Was that a salvational message? Get in the ark? Yes, it was. It was. And it was important to trust and to obey and to get in the ark, which that ark is just a symbol. It's a representation of the protection and the salvation and the surety that we find in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord for that. Okay, that's what Noah preached. How about this one? Exodus chapter 12, verse 13. It says, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon your houses. Yeah, you, you, the blood has to be applied to your home. 
And not just, not just for all your families, but in the, how about the doors of your heart? How about the doors to the temple of your soul? The blood has to be applied. That was a message. That was a message that was delivered by the messenger of God. Apply the blood. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Was that a warning message? Was that a salvational message? Was that a message that was motivated in love to save and to restore? Absolutely, my brothers and sisters. But the question that the scriptures ask, not, not ancient centuries, the present day modern church, if that came to pass, and if it was sure, what makes you think that today, 21st century Christians, that we can escape if we don't take seriously the loving admonitions of a loving God? What makes you think we're going to escape? You know the story. You know that uh, it did not fare well but for, we see a testament that some will escape in every crisis and in every situation. How about this one? I don't know if you can read that, but uh, hopefully just if you look at the picture, what we see here in this illustration, we see a description of the siege of Jerusalem when uh, the armies of Babylon came and completely destroyed and devastated and did not the messengers of God for years gave a loving admonition, change your ways. Don't, don't do as the other nations did. Don't live like the way the Egyptians and the Canaanites don't adopt their customs. Follow God, obey his voice, keep his commandments, reflect his glory. Did they not admonish the nation. Listen, we don't have to guess what happened. Daniel, who was in Babylon, who, who was part of the siege, part of those who were taken captive, he says, you can read it in Daniel 9, 11, yea, all Israel has transgressed thy law even by departing because they have not obeyed their voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us and the oath which was written in the law of Moses. What about that curse? Because we have sinned against him. God, you, you can read it in, Revel, what is it, Leviticus chapter 18. When you come into the land, don't do as all the nations that lived there did before you. Because if you follow those same footsteps, you will forfeit the land just as much as they did. Brother, did those words come to pass? Was those words sure? Did it happen? Absolutely. And that's the message for the modern church, the modern generation, is if this happened, what makes you think that you've gotten away with anything in this life? But was, did somebody escape? Was it, was it a complete exile of everyone? Or was there somebody who by God's grace escaped. Absolutely. Let me show you this. You may not be able to read it, but you can read it in Jeremiah chapter 40, verses 2 to 4. We're told that, oh, let me just paraphrase this, the captain of the guard of the armies of Babylon, he came and he took Jeremiah, he took him out of the prison. Why was Jeremiah in prison? Who remembers the story? Because he kept preaching a message, God's message. God's message to obey his voice so you can avoid all the, the coming destruction that's coming. And who put him in prison? Who put Jeremiah in prison? You know the story. The, the, the nation of Israel, they didn't want to hear it anymore. And when the nation of Babylon came and they destroyed Jerusalem, they took Jeremiah out of prison. And they said, you know, Jeremiah, all these things happen to you. You know why? Because you, the nation, has disobeyed God. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Jeremiah knew that. And the nation should have understood that. I mean, you can read it, Jeremiah 42 to 4. Listen, you disobeyed 
You disobey. Let me just read one line. It says, now the Lord has brought it and done according to what he has said because you've sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed his voice. That's why all this has come upon you. Can you how, how did Babylon get the message? And yet Israel couldn't figure it out. How's that possible? After, my brothers, after he sent him Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and a bunch of other minor prophets and they still couldn't get the message. How is it that Babylon understood the message? But then, you know, you read the, you keep reading to verses three and four. He tells them, but you know what, Jeremiah, you're free. And, you know, it's up to you. Would, would you like to come back to Babylon with us? And we're going to take care of all your expenses. Or look at the whole land is before you. The whole land is before thee. Whether it seems good and convenient for thee, you can go wherever you want. Praise the Lord. Not everybody went into Babylon captive. Not everybody suffered the dire retributions, the inescapable retributions when we disobey the word of God. Not everybody. Because of his faithfulness, he was able to escape. Praise the Lord for that. What about this generation? Oh, my brothers, let me just tell you. The reason why we're told in Hebrews is because this generation is, it, it is, it is the worst. But, but you know what? This is a positive message, and that's actually a message of love, and it's good news, let me tell you. Because when we can at least acknowledge and recognize our situation, when we can at least diagnose what the problem is, then by God's grace, maybe there's hope for us, and there is hope. But this generation is by far the worst. And I'll tell you why, because we have more light. We have the example of the flood. We have the example of the children of Israel in Egypt. We have the example of their wandering in the wilderness. We have the example of the early church. We have the example of the Reformation. We have so much more history. Have we learned? Are we learning? And as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, all these things happen for us as examples. It happened to them, I should say, as an example that we should not follow. We should not lust. We should not fall into the same condition of unbelief. But listen, in spite of all the light that we have from God's word, let me show you this. This came out, uh, I don't know if you can see the date, it says March 8. When was that? When's March 8? Yesterday. What happened yesterday? Express News, NATO fighter, NATO fighter jet get green light to carry nukes as tensions with Russia source. Listen, they just escalated the crisis that we have in our world. They've just escalated as to the highest level possible. Yes, they're going to start doing their exercises and they have they can now start uh, using, uh, you know, the war games, you know, with the simulations with the nuclear, with the nukes. And then you can read here, it says F-35A Joint Strike Fighters have been certified to carry thorough nuclear weapons as the tensions between Russia and NATO hit a breaking point. You know, we are so, let me, let, let me say it this way. We are on the verge, if not because God sees the situation and he says, okay, let me hit the pause button. And he puts his finger on the pause button. If not for God's intervention, we are on the verge of a total destruction in a nuclear conflagration against a superpower like Russia who has more nuclear bombs and apparently what the reports say, they have more than we do. At least that's what, that's what the reports say. Oh, Andy, but that's just one newspaper. Is it just one newspaper? How about this one, Newsweek? I hope you can see the date, March 8, 2024. 
NATO moving missiles closer to the Russian border. Is that escalation? Is that a sign of, uh, of, uh, that we're beginning to enter into peace talks? No, my brothers, no. No, it, what, what it is, it, it is, it, it is just, listen, you don't get all dressed up to not go anywhere. You, you've heard the saying, right? You, you don't put on all the clothes and you get, you know, and get the kids ready just to stay home. And listen, they're getting ready. They're planning to do something. But God, listen, God is still in control. And he still says, hold, 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 hold until the servants of God can be sealed in their forehead. We have a work to do. And God is holding everything back so that his church, his people can accomplish the work. And notice what it says. Listen to this. Several European countries have raised concern that Russia's war against Ukraine could eventually lead to a greater conflict. Well, it's not just Russia. Notice, it says down here, the military alliance has taken several steps to bolster its defense along the eastern border in recent months. Listen, including by conducting trainings in the spring for over how many troops? How many troops? 90,000 troops from all 32 of the member states and countries. My brothers, listen, this is not in the best interest for the people in Europe. It's not within the best interest for the people in Russia. It's not in our best interest for this to take place. This is working at cross purposes to everything that God has commanded in his word. I mean, listen, it's been over 2,000 years that God says, love your enemies. Pray for them. You know, show, show kindness, show respect. And if, from what I understand, if, if you just look at, we're not going to look at everything, but I mean, Russia, they believe in the Bible, don't they? Ukraine, they believe in the Bible. They claim to. They profess to. They're praying to the same God. And the same God is telling them, love your enemies. Do good unto those who, who, who do evil to you. My brothers, what we're seeing here is, isn't helping anyone. And then here's another one. You say, but Andy, are you sure it's, it's, this is really happening? Here's a third one. This also came out March 8. French soldiers train for the killing fields of Europe. They're training. They're preparing. They're getting ready. I didn't write the headline. I didn't make the story. And then look at the subtitle here. The world, this is what the senior French colonel from the military said. Notice what he said. No, notice what they're barely figuring out. They're, they're just barely figuring this out. The world has revealed its true nature. God told you what the true nature of this world is. We have warring members that lust within us. And from that, that's where all wars come from. He says, listen, the world has revealed its true nature. It's unstable. It's dangerous. And not everyone is a friend. They're, they're just barely figuring this out. And God has revealed it. You, you read Romans. Maybe we should just take a quick pause here. Romans chapter 3. Look at what it says in Romans 3 verse 15. Their feet are swift to shed blood. That, that's fulfilled. Look at verse 16. Destruction and misery are in their ways. That's being fulfilled. You can check that one off. Look at Romans 3, 16, 17. The way of peace have they not known. That's being fulfilled today. If everything that the messengers have spoken, it's all coming to pass. It's all being fulfilled. They're just barely figuring this out. Listen, you, you can't trust unless... Unless the Spirit of God constrains and restrains those warring members within our body, then we can have some sort of peace and unity and love. But he's saying, man, this world's dangerous, man. You can't trust anybody. Of course not. You can't trust Satan. Of course, of 
course you can't give billions of dollars thinking, listen, if we give the other side billions of dollars, they're going to be our friends. And, and we learned that uh, the billions that was given to a certain country, that money was funneled and they attack our own military troops in, in the Middle East. Thinking that uh, we can buy f the friendship, land for peace, money for peace, bombs for peace. No, my brothers, it's only when God's spirit comes into my life. When, when, when is peace coming to this earth? When Jesus comes, right? When Jesus comes and takes Satan and casts him in the lake of fire, then there'll be perfect peace in the world. When will peace come into my life? Same thing. Say, Jesus has to come, take Satan out, and cast him out of my life. When will I have peace in my home? Same principle. Same truth. We've, we've known God through the ancient prophets. Texts that were written thousands of years ago from the book of Psalms and Isaiah. They all predicted, all prophesied of this day. But you know, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you how we can stop all this right now. You know, if uh, we have to pass, there has to be a, a, a new rule that says that th these men, these men who are giving the green light, somebody gave the green light, somebody approved this. And the men who, the men who said, let's move, we're going to move the missiles closer. And the men who said, let's start training. Listen, the men who are actually giving those orders, we have to have a new rule that says that they, we have to put them at the front of the battle so that when the war begins, they're going to be there to, to actually fight the fight. And, and not just them, their families and their kids. If we implement that one rule, you know what's going to happen? That those who are calling for this and those who are, uh, who are paying for this and those who are actually implementing this, if we put them at the front of the line where they have to do the fighting, you know what's going to happen? We'll have perfect peace right away. We'll have perfect peace. You know why? Because they're not going to, they're not putting themselves at risk. You know who they want to risk? They want to risk you. They want to risk me. They want to risk our children to go and do all the killing and all the fighting. Yes, my brothers. They're ready to send everybody else to go to do all the fighting for them. I don't know, we don't have a whole lot of time. Let me, let me just read, uh, oh, I don't even know if we can have time for this. You know, let me introduce you to the new holiday destination for what is called burglar, burglar, burglary tourism. Burglary tourism. You know, what's happening is that criminals from around the world are planning vacations. And listen, we're not, we're not picking on, on one country. And even if it names a country, it's not everybody. It's not everybody doing this. It might be 80%, but it's not everybody. But we have, we have, now listen, you wouldn't believe it if the Los Angeles Times didn't publish it. And it's not just four people. You read the article, they're gangs of tourism. And, and what are the tourism, what are, what are these tourists doing? They're planning vacations. But they're not going sightseeing. They're not taking pretty pictures. They're not visiting our, our institutions. They're coming to commit uh, what is called thefts, robberies. Police have dubbed the phenomena burglary terrorism. And, and those are the, that's those who get the actual visas to come, you know, on the airplanes. These, th this is not talking about those that are sneaking in. No, they're coming legally. We're not even talking about the others. These are the ones that come legally. You would think, you would think that they would ask, you know, uh, so what is the purpose of your visit to our nation? You would think they would ask that, right? You think they would ask, okay, do, 
So you're going to be here for as a church. Do you have enough money to cover your expenses while you're here in the country? You think that we would ask those questions. This has been going on for five years. And uh, let's, let's look at this. My brothers, this is an indication that Jesus is about to come. He's about to come. Now, this is not uh, to indicative of everyone. But unfortunately, it is a crisis. And unfortunately, we see here that Haiti violence sees police attack with machetes as gangs wreak havoc. Brother, the, 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 the havoc is not just here. It's not just there. It's everywhere. It's increasing. And I, it, it seems to me that somewhere in the prophetic text it says, and in the, in the last days there shall be distress of nations. Wars, hearts failing for fear, and they shall hate one another because iniquity shall increase, the love of many will wax cold. It seems to me that we've read that somewhere. But listen to this. This was also just came out March 5, 2024. It says a state of emergency has been declared in the country after gangs attack two prisons. You mean... Usually the story is, you know, they, they go and attack and rob a bank. You know, you would think, okay, we can understand what their motive is to attack a, a bank, but they're attacking prisons. They're breaking into prisons. You know what they're doing? It So they can recruit help. They're breaking into prisons to get the prisoners, the gangs out so that, and, and so they can do what? Notice what they've done. It says they've, what? They've attacked the prison, setting many criminals free. It is now thought that 80% of the Haitian capital is controlled by these gangs. Listen, you talk about a collapse. The, the nation is at the verge of collapsing. And the, the desperation is so bad. No supplies, no food, no peace, no security, no nothing. Notice. Describing the violence in the country, a journalist on the ground told the Daily U.S. Express that cannibalism has been witnessed on the streets as the violence reaches unprecedented level. What does unprecedented mean? It means never before seen. We can start, we can break out singing, coming again, coming again. Jesus is coming again. Cannibalism, my brothers and sisters. Is that because of, due to barbarianism, or is that due to desperation and hunger and starvation, or is it a mixture of everything? You know, it's hard to believe that this, but you know, it has, has is there not cannibalism predicted here in the book of the prophets? Yes, it's happened before. And it's when, it's when the Holy Spirit begins to withdraw and God leaves them to, their, to the mind of their own, to the devising of their own minds. We close with this one. This is the last one. And we pray. You, you wouldn't believe this if I told you. If, if I told you this, you just wouldn't believe it. So that's why I'm going to read this to you. Now this, the title, the headline says, Weekend at Bernie's. Now, apparently somebody told me this morning that that's a movie that came out. And then somebody else clarified to me, oh, no, there was actually two movies that came out. I haven't seen the movies. I haven't seen them. And, and I'm not in encouraging you. You don't have to see the movie. Listen, the movies have come, have come real today. But it's apparently about a movie about, you know, some people, some guys that take a dead corpse with them everywhere they go. And this says that The Weekend at Bernie's premieres in Ohio. And it's not talking about a movie, my brother. It's talking about real life. And it talks about two women in Ohio. Look, look, look at, the, look at the, the line under Weekend at Bernie. It says, cops, women propped up dead man, then withdrew his cash. Two women in Ohio propped up a man's corpse in their vehicle and withdrew money from the dead man's bank account before dropping him off, you know, at the hospital. And then, uh, 
It says that uh, they, uh, they put the corpse, placed the body in the front passenger seat, and then headed to a nearby bank drive through window. My brothers and sisters, there has to be something morbid going on in the psyche of this generation. I mean, I can understand and if uh, somebody, you know, robs somebody's wallet, they rob the wallet, they take the card, they go to the bank and take his money out. They, did, they didn't rob the wallet. They didn't rob the wallet. They took the body. They took the corpse with them. How, how, did, how, do you, how, how is that possible? How do you take a dead body, you dress him up, you put him on the car, you put a seatbelt on him, you're driving around town saying hi to people. How do you do that, my brothers and sisters? You go up to a teller machine, and then the teller, you know, the teller says, oh, I see, okay, we know the person, go ahead, take the money. How do you do that, my brothers? Can I show you, can I show you the, these hardened, stone cold, hardened, can I show you the hardened criminals? Can I show them to you? My brother, that, that, could be my, that could be my grandma. That could be my neighbor. That, that, could, that could be any one of us, if not because of the restraining, compassionate, loving God. You know, when, I'm not surprised at what human nature is capable of doing unless we are restrained by God's Holy Spirit. There's no, I'll, I'll, tell you what, I'll tell you what God says. When there's nothing to eat and the Sunday law crisis comes, there's no food, there's no water, human nature is going to kill to survive. That's what human nature is, it, it, that's what we're seeing playing out every day. And we're told here, we close with this, our high calling, page 94. If you suppose for a moment that God will treat sin lightly or make provisions or exemptions so that you can go on committing sin and that the soul suffer no penalty for doing so, you are under a terrible delusion of Satan. Listen, no one is going to get away with anything. No one is escaping the justice of a loving, compassionate Savior when you reject his salvation. No one's getting away with anything. And just because we don't see swift retribution, we want to think that maybe God has forgotten. He hasn't forgotten. We're told in 2 Peter chapter 3, it's not that God is slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness. He's merciful. He's long-suffering, not willing for any to perish, but that all can come to repentance. Probation is being extended in mercy and love so that people can repent and turn around and come to know him. But if we continue down that path after, after God's warning has been despised and rejected, the Bible says if, if the Old Testament prophecies came true and people received their reward, what makes you think? that this generation is going to escape if we neglect so great a salvation. And then Psalm 76 tells us, Thou dost, didst cause judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still. When God rose in judgment, he doesn't just come. He's not just coming in judgment to bring retribution against all the disobedient. He's not, that's not the plan. It may be part of it, but that's not the plan. He's coming to save all the meek of the earth, those who love him and keep his commandments. And when, when the terrible destruction came in the days of the flood, it wasn't just to exact vengeance and judgment and justice. He came to save those who loved him and provided a way out. And when the same destruction came to, to the nation of Israel and they all went into slavery, we see what happened where God makes a way of escape for all those who don't refuse his plan of salvation, his gift, the greatest gift that he's given to us. 
Oh, my brothers and sisters, how can we say no to a loving, compassionate God? A God who has given everything, who spared no expense, who emptied all of heaven to purchase our salvation. How could we say no to such a, a wonderful, compassionate Savior? May God help us that we may say yes. Say yes, Jesus. I, I work it out in my life. I open my heart to you. You come and manage and take control. And you work everything out for your good pleasure. Let us bow our heads. We thank you, Lord, for your many blessings, for your love, for your protection. Save us, Lord. Grant us the grace, Lord, that we may heed your voice and find out what your will is. Lord, you're coming soon, no question about it. Help us to get ready. Help us to get our homes ready. We thank you for the word. We thank you for your blessings. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.